Hey guys and welcome back. The fifth season of Outlander is upon us and today we're going to be discussing the first episode of the fifth season of the series, otherwise titled The Fiery Cross. Now this premiere that we just watched happens to be titled after the book, the story of which the season in its entirety shall follow. But in the book as well, it happens to be the title of the 22nd chapter, the events of which by the way do get covered down the road on this episode. But let us get started though with the opener of the episode, we've got Murta with a young Jamie Fraser, Murta at this point, and as I probably repeatedly mentioned during my review of season 4, should no longer be part of the story. But this scene we're watching over here is out of the past with Jamie as a child in order to kind of link it to the end of this episode, the very final scene of the episode, that promise that he made to Jamie, the promise that he made to Jamie's mother to stay by Jamie's side and to protect him at all times. This is the same promise, the same vow that Jamie releases him from by the very end of this episode, but I will be getting to that in due time. Let's not forget as well that we've got a new intro to the series, even though this is not really a review bit, but I think I prefer the voice on the old one. Circling back though to the events of the episode, we're on track to the planned wedding of Roger and Brianna. However though, on the pages of the novel, it was Roger that bought her a wedding ring rather than Jamie having Myrta make one for them. I do think it does work either way though, because be it Roger that bought it or Jamie that had it made, both events, the one from the novel and the one from this episode, they do have their very own significance and their very own feel, each in its own way. Now instead of this wedding being planned at the very beginning of the episode, bringing one couple in holy matrimony, it happens to be two couples on the pages of the novel, the first of which is the one that we did watch get married over here, while the second one would be Duncan Innes and Jocasta. We did hear about their marriage, the proposal that Innes made to Jocasta, but that's something for later on. We're going to be discussing that in detail later on. I mean, we've got a lot of easter eggs to the events with Duncan Innes and Jocasta out of the novels on this episode. I'm going to talk about those, but the details about Duncan Innes we're going to discuss when we get there over the course of the series. One thing though over here and on another note, I would have expected it would end up being Myrta and Jocasta instead of Duncan and Jocasta. With Myrta being alive on the series, I mean that's already a deviation away from the events of the novel, I would have expected these two would end up being together. But that is not happening so far, I don't think it's gonna happen and I believe they're gonna stick to the novel on this one, it's gonna be Jocasta and Duncan Innes and I believe as well that Myrta has got something coming for him and I really don't think it's gonna be something great, I mean he's one of the more exciting characters but I think that season 5 is gonna be the end for him, gonna talk about that later on on this video though. But okay though, Duncan is already proposed to Jocasta, I do think that Jamie's comments about Roger being a heretic, I think that complements Duncan's contemplation of whether or not he should tell Jocasta on the pages of the novel that he isn't Catholic. The episode did away with the priest bit, you know the priest that was supposed to marry the two couples, he was supposed to get arrested, putting a halt to the entire marriage thing, the entire wedding thing, for the time being though and not forever. However, I did like the idea that the series did not play with that thing that they do on every series and the thing that they do on the novel as well or Diana Gabaldon does on the novels as well which is basically all about, you know, trouble every step of the way, complications every single step of that way and that's a trope that I'm not really a big fan of. I mean, no couple or family has got that much bad luck and this kind of makes it a little bit more realistic in my opinion. Now we get a flashback out of season 1 during the wedding, the wedding of Jamie and Claire, that was a refreshing moment, as for their repeating of the statement, as long as we both shall live, they've both over so many seasons, over so many pages of the novels of the story, that they will find one another over and over again and stick together, and most definitely for as long as they both shall live. Now one thing I'm perfectly certain of is that John Gray was never part of this novel, 
But with him being part of the wedding, it is understandable. The show wants to keep bringing him back. Generally speaking, it is easier to try and give one character multiple arcs, suitable arcs, in most instances inspired by the novel. And that is exactly what they did over here. And it makes a lot more sense logistically as well. I mean, they might need him on a future season. They will definitely need him on a future season. So it is easier to keep the guy on their payroll, keep paying him, keep bringing him in as part of the story. Now the key word in my last statement over here is that he never made an appearance in person, but he did make some kind of appearance on the pages of the novel. In other words, his letters to Jamie did make an appearance. Now first and foremost, he does mention these letters over here. Jamie, on the pages of the novel, just like he did here, did enlist his help through those letters in finding Stephen Bonnet, which we do hear of on this episode. Later on, down the road in the events of the novel, Brianna does find one of those letters concerning Bonnet and his whereabouts, but as opposed to her overhearing them discuss it this early in the events of the series, she does read it in a letter and decently at a later stage in the events of the Fiery Cross. Now, needless to say that even though a decent amount of time has passed, it is still understandable how this whole situation with Bonnet would still cause a lot of grief and a lot of hurt to Brianna. And damn, Roger had to sing one of my favorite Nat King Cole songs and later on Frank Sinatra songs, Love, Well Played Outlander. Oh, and yeah, he does sing to Brianna on the pages of the novel and on their wedding night as well. Not enough memory at the moment to remember what the song was over there. But yeah, though, Nat King Cole's love was a pretty good choice over here. Now, Lizzie is still around. I'm trying to figure out over here what they plan on doing with her on this season. I mean, you've got her arc on the novel with both Josiah, whom we do meet on this episode, and his twin brother, Keziah, whom we are yet to meet. Possibly they don't plan on going down that road, but if they do, we're definitely meeting Keziah. However, though, and I gotta say, it would be an interesting arc. A bit funny as well, if you ask me. That's what I thought of it on the pages of the novel. But let's wait and see if they go by the book on this one. But yeah, though, the bit with removing the tonsils, that's also very, very true to the source material. Now let us talk though about one of my favorite moments on this episode because of how true it was to the novel. We've got Jocasta doing the same thing that she did with Roger on the pages of the novel, insinuating that he would care for the young kid if the kid had money, and he does rage over it as well on the pages of the novel. I do not want your money, my wife does not want your money, and my son will not have it. Cram it up your hole, eh? Word for word, that's the response that he gave her on the pages of the novel, and the actor did really deliver on the lines here. But when it comes to Roger, there's also the talk about him, about war, about him having to fight being fit of age and all. Jamie believes Roger will have to learn and become a warrior somehow. Claire wants him to work on keeping him out of it, and Jamie does find a compromise. However, when you think about it, we're still missing that conversation about war that Jamie does end up having with Roger, so I'm kind of looking forward to that as well. One other thing to take note of over here is that Roger swore fealty to Jamie, not just because he is his father-in-law and all of that good stuff, but also because he wants him to accept him. He wants him to forgive him for not coming back right away after knowing about the whole ordeal with Bonnet and Brianna and the pregnancy. But there we go, the title of the episode, The Fiery Cross. When you're a chieftain and you set yourself to war, sending a signal, a call for your men to gather. But just like in the novel, Jamie is not a chieftain, he pulls this and hopes it works, and it definitely does. Circling back though to a point I barely spoke of at the beginning of this episode, I've got this feeling watching this episode that this season is possibly going to be the end of the line for Murta. I mean, it is possible that he's gonna stay alive, but I think he's gonna end up dead before the end of the season and gone like he is in the novels and before this point. And I don't really think he's gonna make it back from the presumed dead the way he did once already on the series. Now finally, the scene between Jamie and Murta at the very end, releasing Murta from that promise, that vow that he once made, all of that was pretty touching. But okay, speaking of the verdict, I would rate this episode with a solid 8 out of 10. It covered the first two parts, or almost covered the very first two parts of the fifth book in the novel series. It even picked a few things out of other parts of the book, like Brianna's realization that Jamie has tasked John Gray with finding the whereabouts of Bonnet, but it covered it all in a pretty decent and smart fashion. 
And yes, some of the details, some of the aspects of the chapters that this episode covered are missing. Some have been done differently, even though the differences are minimal. But as I've always stated on each and every review, not just of Outlander, but of all the series and the movies I did review on this channel, that's usually the nature of TV adaptations. They will elaborate on some aspects of the source material and focus on the spirit of others, which is exactly what this episode did. So yeah, I did like it, I do think it deserves an 8 out of 10, not the best episode ever, but a pretty good introduction for the entire season to come. That being said, let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this episode, how excited are you for the future episodes of this season. Let me know as well if you did like this video by dropping it one of those much appreciated likes, subscribing to this channel, and make sure while you're at it to enable notifications in order to get updates whenever I upload a new video, publish a new community post, or start a new live stream. But until the next time that you tune in for another one of my videos, Outlander or otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in to this review and have a great day.